o'clock. I think we have. Um, I think we have most of the people. So. Sorry, let me fix. Okay. So as usual, um, the slides are in the Google Classroom, which I'm sure all of you are in by now. Let me know if you can't see them. I think I saw someone in the slides though, so you probably can see them. And so as usual, I'll take the first part of the class just to um, talk through with anyone who had problems with the homework. If you want to talk about a CAD issue or anything, um, that's fine. Ask questions. If not, enjoy these beautiful models that were created by your peers and yourself, probably. I know some of you might not have been like completely done, with, especially with the in-class ones, but you know, since it's anonymous, hopefully you don't mind too much that I show these. I do appreciate the people who tried the spider for being a bit unique. Um, with the spider, there is a like kind of important feature that these two are missing, which maybe today, if I have time, if you guys are interested, I can show the way that I did the spider, which I think might be valuable, um, might be helpful to know. But last call for questions on last week's stuff. And if there's nothing, we'll get right into the new content. And this week is going to be actually a pretty important one in terms of conceptual high level understanding of CAD. So hopefully you're excited for that. Um, at a glance, things we're gonna talk about variables, modification and configurations that might not mean a whole lot to you, but they'll be very important if you want to get into more advanced modeling and especially working on bigger projects. So the first of these variables you probably have heard about, especially if you've done some computer science or coding, uh, you probably know what a variable is. If not, a variable is just a name for a number, right? Um, I'll show this off in the CAD, but to talk about what it represents, it's, um, it's a way to put in a value when you're modeling, like for the length of a dimension or for one of the parameters in one of the features, you don't have to put in a real number. You can just put in a name and later on you can tell on shape what number should be associated with that name. So um, if that doesn't make sense after I do the demo, um, of course ask, but this week I do want you to follow along kind of with the demo because I think this is something that probably all of you have not done before. Um, even if you have done a lot of previous CAD experience, especially because Onshape has a bit of a strange way that they implement these features. So I do want you to try to follow along. Kind of related to variables, there's something called configurations or configs. Um, in different CAD programs, these might refer to slightly different things. There might be like a part configuration, an assembly configuration, but in general, a configuration will refer to when you have different versions of something that are all stored in the same place. So um, a classic example might be, um, maybe not a classic example, but an easy to think about example is like, let's say that I'm trying to model a bolt. Like I work at a bolt manufacturing company, a fastener company, and I'm tasked with making a CAD file for like quarter 20 bolts. Um, I'm not going to go out here and make a different model for every single quarter 20 bolt that's a different length, right? I know if you looked at the McMaster catalogs, you know there's bolts that are an inch long, an inch and a quarter long, an inch and an eighth long. There's no need for me to make a model for each, every single one of those. And what configurations allows me to do is when I have a big family of parts that are very, very similar to each other, just have small differences, I can just store them all in the same part and I can select a configuration. I can select the one inch configuration maybe, or the one and an eighth inch long configuration and that'll just switch the part to the version that I'm interested in at that moment. So this probably will make more sense too when I show it to you. Um, I know a lot of CAD programs have assembly configurations. Let's say you're designing a car 
and you want to show what the car looks like when it's steered, when it's forward, and when it's steered the other way. And so you can have configurations for the assembly where you put different mate associations or different values for the mates, and you can make the car look steered or unsteered without changing anything. You don't have to make a new assembly, you just change the configuration of the assembly. So hopefully that motivates you in terms of why this is important. And the last thing, I know we're going over a lot of concepts today, but um, in terms of philosophy for CAD, there's kind of this thing called parametric and direct modeling. So the easiest way to start is probably parametric modeling. Almost everything that you've been doing so far is considered parametric modeling, where you're designing something from the ground up. You're thinking about these features, these references, these sketches, and how they relate to each other. You're always working off something that you did before, right? And it's kind of what parametric modeling means. You have these parameters. Um, maybe you have variables. And the advantage of this kind of structured modeling is that you can easily change big aspects of the design. Let's say that, again, I'm designing like um, a vase, right, for flowers. If I come into work one day and my boss tells me, oh, you have to significantly change the size of this vase. You need to make the base way wider. You need to make the neck like twice as thin. The whole thing needs to be like really short. I can easily make those changes in parametric modeling because all I have to do is go in to my sketches, change a few dimensions. And hopefully if I was smart with my feature tree, the whole vase will just update to what I need. Direct modeling is kind of a different approach where it's a lot like working with clay. What you do is you kind of directly push or pull on the geometry. You can kind of look at features that are on there specifically and just expand them, make them smaller. And when you might do this is when you yourself was not the person who designed this thing you're working with. Let's say that you're on a team and someone else hands you this step file of a part that they designed. And you have no idea how they made it because when you import the step file, it doesn't have the feature tree anymore. You're really not sure what sketches they used or what features they used. All you have is the geometry. And in those cases, it might be easier to just do direct modeling where you can make things a bit wider, kind of pull on it, make it bigger, push on other parts, maybe replace faces, delete faces, things like that. So uh, at this point, I'll kind of start to illustrate what I mean by these things. Um, and I'll start with the one that's probably freshest in your mind. I just talked about direct modeling. So um, let me pull up something that I made last week. Um, I'll pick the spider, maybe kind of pull back the curtain and show you how I did it. When I'm designing something in a parametric fashion, I have this feature tree and I, I made all of these things one at a time, building on top of each other. I know every single step, right? Like I drew the sketch, I revolved it to make, let me pull this back. I revolved it to make this disc shape. I had another sketch to do the splines. Then I made the sketch and this sketch. And for the ball bearing grooves, what I did was I swept a circle along this path to kind of make this saddle shaped curvature. And then I patterned it and I added some fillets. And so that's parametric modeling. But then let's say that I am working on my team. Someone drops this on my desk. They give me this file and I have nothing, right? There's nothing in the feature tree. I have no idea if they used a revolve or an extrude or whatever, and let's say that I need to change some of these parts for clearance issues. Onshape has actually a set of direct modeling tools and they're all in this little drop-down menu. Um, it's kind of the one next to the reference geometry menu. I'm not sure, maybe if you have a wide monitor, these are like stretched out, but there are these four tools. And so this is direct modeling where I don't have access to any of the 
features that constructed this part, but I can still modify it. The first one is modify fillet. And so as you might guess, it lets me modify fillets. If I select this circular fillet here, it recognizes that it is a fillet and I can change the value. Let's say I need to make it sharper or maybe I need to make it shallower. And what I can do here, you can see that I directly modeled this. I kind of like, I was working with clay, I kind of smoothed out that fillet. Another thing I can do is delete face. So maybe I don't like the fillet at all. I think you should just meet at a point. I can do that too, using the delete face tool. So you can see now that entire fillet is just gone. Um, there's the move face where, again, it's kind of like I'm working with clay. I'm pulling on this entire face and here it's kind of similar to an extrusion maybe where I can pull that entire face and now it's flat. You can see for comparison what the other side looks like. And then there's replace face. And to use this, you kind of need to know about surfaces, which we haven't talked about, but we will talk about in a future class. So um, you can hang on to that one. But these theories should enable you to do a good amount of changes to geometry that you receive. So um, are there any questions about that? I guess you can, okay, yeah. So that's direct modeling and parametric modeling or the differences. Um, the other thing that you'll probably need for this week's challenges, I'll go back and take a moment for you to absorb them. Again, the slides are in the Google Classroom, so you can pull these up and start thinking about them. Um, the parts of this week should be fairly simple. The rook you've done before in CAD 2, the bolt is very similar to the water bottle cap. The stool also should be somewhat straightforward. Um, the objective of this week's challenges is to kind of get you working with variables. And what I want you to do is be able to make any kind of bolt just by changing a few numbers in your variable table, which I'll demonstrate, or the rook. I want you to just have one part that's the rook, but I want you to be able to change it to be multiple different kinds just by changing a few variables. And in the case of the stool, I want you to use configurations where you have an entirely different shape, right? I, I picked a very simple shape change here, but it can really be anything. So keep these in mind. This is what you're going to be working on today and the rest of the week for homework. And if you have any specific questions right now, feel free, but I will start demonstrating how you use variables. So start off with a simple example, maybe what we did in week one, which was a sprocket. Um, so I'll start off with a sketch and I won't, do any of the details, I'll just do the basic shape, which is something like this. And that. Um, so hopefully you're pretty familiar with this, having done it yourselves. Whoops. So I have this little disc here and let me just take a moment to dimension it. So I made this and let's say this is a product I'm designing. 
Um, what happens now if I need to um, if I need to have like a slightly different one? Let's say that my job is to make like a series of these things where every customer who buys one needs it slightly differently. Maybe some customers need bigger ones, some need ones with more holes in them, some need thicker ones. So it doesn't make sense for me every time I need a different one to go into the sketch and change the dimensions. That might get confusing, I might make a mistake. There's a lot of things that make that just not the most elegant way to do it. And the alternative that I'll present to you is the variable table. If you have these four tabs on your right, you probably noticed them before, you can click them to expand it, click it again to close it. The bottom most one is your variable table. And what you can do, it invites you to add a variable and if you do that, you can see in the feature tree, a variable shows up, it's called variable name. If I double click in this box, I can change it. So I can change it to, let's say thickness. And I can just keep adding variables. Let's say number of holes. One thing about variable names is Onshape doesn't let you put spaces in them. Like I can't do that, it turns red. I can do um, diameter maybe, I'll just do a couple. The next thing you'll see is that it asks you for a variable type. So thickness is a length, that is what I want. Number of holes, that's the number. And diameter, that's the length. So say my thickness, maybe a quarter inch. Number of holes, three. Diameter, uh, I think it was 10. So this is how you fill out a variable table. Um, you can see in the feature tree, you can see the values and the names. So I'll, I'll pause here for questions. I see someone has a hand raised. I was saying you could use what, underscores and hyphens. Yeah, you can use those. I think so, yeah. And you'll see whenever it updates, it updates in the feature tree. I guess it really depends on your, um, the standard for wherever you're working. I think some, some have them like all caps, kind of aggressively. Sure. Yeah, you can have underscores. Um, is everyone else good with creating variables? Because you will have to do this today. All right, you're always free to ask later again. So I guess since no one asked. The next question is how do I use these variables? The kind of peculiar thing about Onshape is that it considers variables kind of a feature. So what you have to do now, if you created variables after the thing you want to have them in, you need to move them all to the top of your feature tree, or at least before the thing that you want to put them in. So I want to use the variables in sketch one. So the variables need to appear before sketch one. So you can just click and drag each one. You can, in Onshape, you can just multi-click to select more than one. So now that I move my variables to the top of my tree, I'll go back into my sketch. And the first thing, okay, I want the diameter to be a variable. So I go in, instead of in the dimension, instead of typing a number like 10, what I do now is I do um, the pound sign, the octothorpe hashtag, and the variable name. So my variable name was diameter, so I did pound diameter. And you can see it still says 10, but that's because the value of my diameter is 10. You can see if I do the number of holes, instead of just having the number three hard coded in, I can put in the variable num holes. So it doesn't like that for some reason. Um, I'll come back to that. Yeah, I'm not sure it's up to that, but I'll 
revisit that um, in the extrusion. I can also put variables in these fields in these feature windows. So when I do something like this, you can see the number updated, but now it's the variable. Um, I guess what I just realized is some places don't let you put in variables. So I guess this is kind of a demonstration of a counter example. You can't put in a variable in this sketch pattern. So when you put in the pound sign, you can see nothing comes up. So that probably means Onshape doesn't allow you to put variables there. But the way you can fix that is just to not use a sketch pattern and instead use a feature pattern. And hopefully that just goes to show that you should usually use feature patterns instead of sketch patterns. So right. And because it's a feature pattern, I now need to make the whole a feature instead of part of the whole thing. So really quickly, I'll just That region. Did that work? That did not work. Uh -huh. I selected the opposite region. There we go. And finally, I can do my feature pattern now. Selecting the, the cut extrude as my feature. And as my axis, I can just click any circular face or circle. And here, now this will accept variables. So if I put in the pound sign, you can see it recognizes that I want a variable. And what I want is the number of holes. And I'll do something like that. And at first glance, this looks exactly like what I had before. But now when someone comes in and tells me they need a disk with four holes and they need it to be a foot in diameter and they need it to be twice as thick, I can easily change it just like that. I don't have to worry about figuring out which sketch or which feature I need to open up. All I need to do is go into my variable table and change the variable. So hopefully that's pretty clear. Remember that sketch patterns do not take variables. If you have any questions about specifically that, feel free to ask. Uh, just to contextualize the challenges now, uh, for the bolts, I want you to have at the very least, a variable head size, so how big the hexagon is. I want you to have a variable length, so how long the bolt is, and a variable pitch, so how finely the threads are turned. You're free to add more variables. You're free to use a configuration if you want. But at the minimum, I just want you to be able to change those things with the variable table, and hopefully that one's not too hard. Second one is the rook. Um, I realized I did not actually write it, but you know the reason I didn't finish the sentence is because I was looking up what these square things are called on a castle. Um, as much as I thought about it, I couldn't figure out like what these square blocks are called. And after some searching, apparently they're called Merlins. So. I hope that's correct, but what I mean by that is the, the square things, um, square blocks, the castle. So that's a challenge if you want, but 
for the rooks, I want you using variables to be able to change the height and the width of the base and the thickness of the stem. If you want to add other variables, change other parts of it, you're free to. If you want to make a configuration, you're also free to. But I do want you to have those variables. And this one might be a challenge just because um, it's a bit tricky, you'll find when you update parts to make sure all these other things like fillets update properly. So it'll be interesting. And before I talk more in depth about the stool, now I'll start to show you what you can do with configurations. So in this right four tabs again, you'll see that was the variable table. Now we have a configuration panel. So if you open it up, you see something like this. What you can do is click Configure Part Studio. And let's say, you see there's already a configuration. It's called default. And that's what you had by default. Um, let's say I want a version of this product that has no holes. So there's the default version, and there's the no holes version. And you can see. The way I switch between them is I right click it and the first option is to switch to. And right now nothing happens when I switch between my configurations because I didn't do anything. Right now they're exactly the same whether I'm on the default configuration or the no holes configuration. So let's change that. When I'm on a configuration, I can click configure features, this little plus sign. And now you can see this like box opened up. It says select sketches or features to configure. So as you might guess, what I want from this configuration is for there to be no holes. And um, what is the feature that that exists from? That's the extrude feature here and the circular pattern. So let's say um, now I need parameters to configure. So that means any of these things inside of the feature window. So the way to make it have no holes is to be picking a different configuration, right? So I selected the face region, the face and sketch regions to extrude because that's what would change between the configurations. You can see there's like a dotted line around it. And I'll say done because now I'm done. Now with the configuration I want to modify, with that one selected, I can go into um, I can go into that, that feature, and you can see there's still like that kind of like dotted line around that parameter. And so if I now accept that, you can see the hole has disappeared. But when I switch to default, the holes are there again. This example was kind of bad. You can see that it breaks both the extrude and the circular pattern because I did not, um, I don't think through it from a top-down level, which you should. But the problem that arises here is that you can't have an extrude with no base region selected. So the way that I would properly do this is to, is to choose a sketch that has like something else that I need to extrude so that the feature doesn't just go away, right? Um, perhaps a better example um, I'll show in a moment, but that was pretty much how you create a configuration table. That's it for the me talking part that you have to listen to. You're free to go and create the stool. So to explain the stool, I do want you to use a variable too if you choose this one. So that can just be the number of legs. And this is the one where I want you to use a configuration where I want you to have a differently shaped like seat boss. So this one is a hexagon. This one is a hexagon with 
circles in it. So these are the challenges. You're free to work on them now. Um, I guess it's already 6.30, so maybe like 10 or so minutes, I'll start calling on people and you're free to get to work. If you do want to see me do a proper demonstration of configuration table, I'll begin that now. But you are free to do your own thing. Yeah, so the reason that that kind of broke it was because <clears throat> for the configuration, I chose a parameter without which the feature doesn't generate. So you always want to have it so that the feature will still generate even if you change the parameters to the way that you want it to. Um, to show what I mean by that, this is my front plane. Make my sketch and I'll do something a bit different. Um, let's say that I do need a central bore and I'm also going to have the whole pattern, the weight savings. And I won't worry about fully dimensioning it for now. So when I'm in a situation like this, this is where it would make more sense to use the configuration where say I extrude cut the central bore and the pockets. And this is what it looks like in both configurations. You can see the default has all four holes and no holes has all four holes. Maybe more accurately, will be called no pockets. And so now the way I'd achieve my design intent without breaking my feature tree, now that I structured it differently, I'd select this feature and I'd select the same parameter, which is the sketch regions that I selected. Um, and I hit done. What happens now? I'm in the no packets configuration. And you can see for that parameter, there's four selections. So what I'll just do is I go into the feature. And for that parameter, the one with the dotted lines, Instead of four selections, I just want one selection, which is the central bore. And I don't want the pockets. Yes, I failed to select them, but there you go. One selection, just the bore. And finally, having done that, you can see now the default configuration is different from the no pockets configuration, where the default has the holes, no pockets, does not have the holes. But you can see that nothing is red now, nothing exploded. Okay, so for those of you who are leaving, I guess, uh, main thing, same as always, just do one of the things, submit it to the Google Classroom. I just created all the assignments, so hopefully they work as they usually do. And this week, um, I guess one difference is I wrote the description, but no, there's no need for you to submit like a step file or anything. I just want to see an image with two different versions of your part that you changed with the variables or you switch the configuration of. Yeah. So yeah, for those of you who are gone, I guess, see you next week. For those of you who are here, I'll give you a bit more time, but. In a bit, I'll just, as we usually do, people can share their screens. 
if you have any questions now or later, I'll also take them. I know that was a lot of stuff, but it's very important stuff. Yes, for those who are interested, kind of show my stuff changing. For example, with the pitch, I guess accurately, it's not technically the pitch, it's the number of revolutions over the length. So if you really wanted pitch, what you would do is define the variable in terms of the other variable. But more accurately, it's revolutions. Let's say I change it to 10. You can see that my bolt changes. It has a coarser pitch now. If you're really interested in, um, in accuracy, you can make it so that the thread profile actually gets bigger as you decrease the revolutions. You can imagine that in real life, such a coarsely threaded bolt would have a really big thread. Make it shorter. You can see that's what I meant about it not really being pitch, it's actually revolutions. Rook. Some of you might still have this model, actually. If you really didn't want to make it again, you could just add variables to it. Make this a bit shorter. If you want a challenge, you can make it so that the ratio of the stem and the the parapets stays a certain value. And the way you do something like that, what you can actually do is put in like equations or expressions with variables. Um, let's say here, instead of diameter, I could do it like diameter times 1.5. So that's a mathematical expression with a variable in it. I guess to show you how the configuration works for the stool, I kind of have this one, this version with these three holes in it, and I have the default one that doesn't. I guess based on my second demonstration, it might be a bit unmysterious since you've seen exactly how it works.
And as usual, you're free to make your own variations on the theme. You don't have to make this kind of contrived shape. If you think of something more interesting that still uses configurations, feel free. Same with the rook, same with the bolt. It doesn't have to be a hex head. It can be a socket head or Phillips screwdriver screw. All right, in a minute or two, I'll start calling on people. All right, um, how about we start as we usually do with Alex song. Let me stop my screen share. All right, I see your variables in the feature tree. Yeah. 
maybe if it's working, uh, you can demonstrate like changing the variable. I guess starting with whoever's next, Alex Wu. Oh, um, can, can could you give me a little more time? Yeah, sure. I can I come back to you. Um, I guess Donna then. It's right. not very developed, but um, yeah, that's fine. Are you able to make variables? Are you fine with that part? Um, I haven't been tried yet. Okay, maybe you try that since that's the important part. But okay. I like the top of the stool. Okay, how about Luke? Have a bit more time. Yeah, sure. I'll come back to you too. Yeah, I know you didn't have as much time um, as I was talking for a bit longer. I think Peyton said he was gone. So, Selena, would you like to share? Um, yeah. It's done. So, um, I turned it in. All right, cool. Um, can you demonstrate changing some things? Nice. Yeah, so, yeah, you're free to do the homework or yeah, I kind of challenge. The homework, I'm not done yet, so. Yeah, understandable. If you want to challenge, you can try adding configuration to the bolt or doing some of the expressions or you write variables in terms of other variables. Optional. And I imagine, Thomas, you're probably on the two computers set up. Yeah, I, I got all, all the variables on. I have to, like, I'm making the, the helix for the screw. Okay. Yeah, good luck. I believe in you. So give it another minute, and I might come back to Alex and Luke. How about whenever you're ready, Alex, go ahead and screen share. I'll be waiting. Okay. Um, I I made a mistake, so this will take like five minutes or so. Sure. I guess same goes for you, Luke. If you're ready, just feel free to share at any time. share what I have right now. Sure, okay. How do you snap like two points together? Okay. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. That's fine. Yeah, so which one are you doing? Um, I'm trying to do the, uh, the, um, the, the rook. Okay, yeah, cool. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask. But I think you've been doing pretty well on the homeworks. Yeah, I heard a question about making points snap. Like when I try to, like, I don't, I forgot how to do it. Yeah, so.
So <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure. I like I'm just trying to snap like a sketch for like this like the thread threads onto the helix. So like you can oh okay. Trick, uh, sure. Um leave it, but I don't I I uh, forgot how to like snap the the triangle shape onto the helix. Yeah, there's a few ways you can do that. And it'll work in general whenever you have, whenever you're working with two different sketches. So I know the helix isn't technically a sketch, but it's pretty much the same thing. Maybe that was not the best example. Let's say I have a line that goes through the other planes. Now in this plane. I'm trying to make so one thing you can do on shape usually lets you just like hover over the thing that's in the other plane and it'll let you select things like an edge or a point. So it's not a helix, it's just a line, but it should work the same way. We can just select that point. You can select your point and use the coincident relation. And it'll move your thing over to kind of the closest point in your plane to that point. So that's one way. Another, another method of that doesn't work is you can explicitly make this point be a part of your current sketch. So let's say you have your helix. What you do is you use your project to convert tool. And if you select the helix and you click it, it'll turn it into like a series of slanted black lines, kind of like a long W shape or squiggly line shape. And this will now be in your sketch. So you can work with that point just like you would with one of your points. Again, just make a coincident relation. And a third way that you could do it is when you're drawing that little, in your case, it's the thread profile, you should maybe be able to select that point. I guess in my case, I can't, so. In my case, I can't because the line isn't going through that point, but for the helix, you probably can because the end of the helix should probably be in the plane anyway, even if it's not part of your sketch, but hopefully one of those three things work. And if not, just ask again. Yeah. And the floor is open for people who want to screen share or ask more questions. By the way, Thomas, you are unmuted in case you do not realize. Not that it's a problem, just so you're aware.
All right, uh, last call if you want to share. And if there's no one, just to wrap things up, as usual, here's an assignment for the in-class stuff. Don't feel pressured to finish what you have in class if you're gonna do the homework. Um, as a reminder, you can just turn an image of just a couple versions of your part. And the other assignment is the homework also, as usual. And same thing, just submit images. And that's fine. I just submit a link of the of our thing directly from Onshape. Yeah, that's fine. I know someone did that last week, which was fine. I was able to open it. I just make sure you make it so that I can see it. I guess by default, I think that's how it works. Yeah, I guess anyone can view with the link, so. Yeah, link is fine. Otherwise, that's the end of the class. If you have any questions, I'll take a couple last minute, but otherwise I'll see you all next week. Hope you enjoyed.